This time I'm going to show you how did I come across with the materials that, that inspired me to create the Bear Awakener album. And uh, it actually starts off from this book from 1986. Um, it's called For the Winged Gods and for the Legged Gods. Uh, it's a collection of poet, poetry from the Mansi and Hanti people. And I don't honestly know for how long I've had this book. Um, I don't really remember where did I get it or if it was always at my parents' house or something. I have a vague memory of, uh, of, of um, having this as, as a gift, kind of like a random gift, like, you know, this might interest you and uh, you, know, you can have it kind of in, in this way. But anyways, I don't know how long I've had it, but the importance of it is even greater. Um, as I keep repeating myself with the notion that a lot of the mythical poems that we look at, they are originally lyrics to a song. This holds true in all of the, the Finnish uh, materials. All of the Finnish folk poems were originally sang. You couldn't separate the text and the melody from each other. And uh, the same is true with the Hanti material. It's not in every culture like this. Like some cultures have a tradition of storytelling and, and, and the myths go, um, mythical stories go kind of, the, the way they are expressed are, are within the storytelling and, and songs can be less poetic and have a more of a pre-vocables, for example. Like Yoik, for example, in, in the Sami people consists uh, most of, of, of syllables that, that don't have a, a, a same a similar meaning than, than words have. But with the Hanti Manzi and the Finns, the, all of the mythical material is originally a musical tradition. So to me, to really learn about, um, about how did these people think uh, what was their cosmology? Um, what was their worldview? I would really suggest going into the poems rather than any scientific text or, or, or study. Because the poems are something that maintain the um, level of experience. So, so when you when you actually understand a poem, it it doesn't happen here. It's uh, it's more embodied understanding of of a thing. So it, it it is closer to a real life experience what you can get out from the poems. So, um, so in this way, th this book has been crucial to me. Like. Like, uh, it, it's a rather small collection, but it's so valuable. And, um, and um, the poems in this book are coming from the, the early, early um, research in, in Siberia. So they are poems that are mainly collected by the Hungarian scholars and the Finnish scholars uh, in the uh, early 20th century some of it already on the late 19th century. And as I told you the last time, the main researcher um, for the material that I'm studying is Arturi Kannisto. And um, um, Arturi Kannisto, um, this I showed the last time, here he is with uh, Fyodor Jeblankov, in uh, Pelimka River. And what you are looking now is a PDF from a book published in 1937. Here's a map where he actually traveled to and um, having a look of a wider map 
will help you to understand where exactly he was. So there's Russia and Siberia, the Yamal Peninsula and the Timur Peninsula. Zooming closer, we'll see the Yenisei River and the beginning of an Ob River. Going further, um, now you see the Surgut city. Nisnevardovsk uh, was established in 1970, so this city wasn't existing um, when Karnista was there. And Nefte Yugansk, Neft is oil, so like the name suggests, these cities, um, they have been born um, together with the oil industry. This area is very rich in oil, and Russia produces uh, roughly a 10% of the world's oil from the entire oil production of the world is 10% from this area today. Um, in 1905 the situation was a little different and um, so here you see the Surgut, uh, I gotta go one more close, so Surgut, Tobolsk and Omsk, the three cities and if we now come back to this map, you can see Surgut there, Tobolsk and Omsk. It looks a little different, but the area is the same. And these rivers connecting to the mighty Ob River are the interesting places. Agan River among the Eastern Hunt is a place where I visited in my first field trip in 2002. And and revisited later in 2009 and 14. Tram Yugan is um, still considered one of the most sacred areas among the Eastern Hanti. So these rivers would be Hanti areas mainly. And, and, uh, gosh. And these rivers over here would, would have been Mansi areas at that time northern Mansi and you can see a text Sosva and Pelim here so these are the places where where he stayed for longer and recorded most of the of the bear songs. He published from these journeys five volumes and this this one is uh, published in 1958 uh, so that would be in, in modern England's Mansi folk poetry and uh, this is a volume number four and it says Bären Lieder, Bear Songs. So the entire volume number four is dedicated to bears. Um, there are hundreds of poems and thousands of verses in, in, in this book. Um, and why bears? Because the bear feast was the number one ceremony uh, for both Hanti and Mansi. The bear ceremony or the bear feast, they usually lasted either four days for a female bear and five days for a male bear. And um, the Hanti and Mansi, they um, they believed that that a female has a four-part soul and a male has a five-part soul, which some of the researchers have confused to mean that men are somehow more than women. But um, as I talked about this with uh, Jeremy Danielovich Aipin, he said that actually the fifth soul is what creates the difference between uh, a feminine and masculine and the fifth soul is what makes a man more restless and uh, more uh, unstable. So it's actually the female are better off with the four souls. They are more stable, more independent and uh, more in harmony with everything. So. Five is not necessarily more than four in this case. But, um, so the bear feast lasted from four to five days and it was full of songs, theater, dances, ritual. It was a combination of everything. And um, during those 
days they sang uh, the most important mythical songs the the songs of creation the the songs of the gods and deities that created the area the origin of the man the 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 fundamental relationships between man and other species and all of this was uh, carried to the generations in in these songs and in these uh, poems that were originally lyrics to a song so how do we go from the poems to the songs this is actually a pretty tricky question because the early research was text oriented the sound was just a curiosity for them they already had established the Finnish literature society and their big archives for poems and, uh, and folk tales but they had no clue that recordings could become something meaningful at that time uh, they had the earliest device for recording sound the phonograph and here you can see a uh, wax cylinder recorder and, and a wax cylinder in its in its place this is there there would be the needle that draw the sound into it and to this part was usually attached a horn that <clears throat> that you used both for listening and with the separate recording head uh, the horn was was helping you to capture the sound into the wax cylinder so it's quite a funky uh, funky uh, equipment I actually have a one so you get a better idea of the size the, here I have a one um, wax cylinder broken one but so this this is how they look like um, quite quite cool little box <laughs> so um, so collecting these was not their job their job was to to uh, collect the poems and and learn about the linguistics you know learn about the language and the grammar and uh, and um, that sort of things they weren't really taking these even seriously and uh, another problem with the wax cylinder is that they lasted only from two to four minutes depending how fast were you rolling and uh, these songs had thousands of verses so sometimes um, one poem might have taken several hours to to sing true so in these wax cylinders we just have tiny clips from the beginning of these songs so that's all we have <clears throat> and how do we connect them so I need to go back to this book because here is the Finnish translation of, of, of the poems that were translated to German in and published in 1958 so 30 years later they are here in Finnish and I have to go to the end notes so if I look the page numbers of each poem in the end notes I have a little description of them and there it has a reference into the 1937 book um, that I had here as a PDF which contains transcriptions of those songs so so all that you see now is just an introduction to the real thing which is notes so most of this publication is just transcriptions of these songs and uh, these are debatable uh, in themselves and uh, we'll we'll discuss them in another episode but here's something in interesting you have Phono phonograph 24c sosfa place of recording saveli vinyalev so now we actually have a path from one publication to another publication to a actual remark 
of the phonograph recording. The name Saveli Vignalev pops up there and I am so happy to have a photo of him in this book earlier. Um, interesting looking man, Saveli Vignalev with his wife. A photo taken by Arturi Kangisto in 1905. He was an interesting singer. The, the, I, I'm very fond of his songs. And uh, so, you know, this is this is so sweet to, to have a, some kind of an opportunity to know something about these people, thanks to these uh, wax cylinders and and uh, and collections of poems. Now that we've found a notation that has an indication to the phonograph number, we can actually find and locate a recording that matches. To do so, I've uh, contacted the Institute of, of um, Languages of Finland, Institute for the Languages of Finland, and their sound archive is the place where the Kannistos recordings are, are kept. So, so I've con contacted them and they've been kind enough to give me a research copy in a, in a digital form. And here uh, I'll have a PDF that gives me the um, <coughs> details of each wax cylinder, the date of recording and uh, the original number of the phonograph. So if we want to find a, a, a phonograph of this recording, I'll just follow these numbers and then match it with these numbers given here. And finally, I can then um, locate the actual recordings by those numbers and this is this is how this is how the detective work goes from from one book to another book to a uh, notion of the phonographs and to the to the archive data and and uh, next time we'll have a listen to them <laughs>